Welcome to Social Allo Ministries, where we are committed to glorifying God while exposing the devil. The Lord is a great teacher. He always gives you the answer before the test. And who is the one who usually puts us to the test? The devil. As was the case when Jesus, he had been baptized, filled with the Holy Spirit. The Heavenly Father said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. He went into the wilderness, fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. Who came along? And put him to the test the devil and there were times when the devil was quoting scriptures to him and jesus came back by quoting the word back to him or at least in proper context <sighs> last year when the lord inspired me to write raised in the wilderness rogue reformers rallying the remnant i thought that i would never hear from another false prophet in my life a couple of things with that book. It talks about those prophets who are going through the wilderness. Some of you call it your cave experience. In some cases, you're going through that experience in a church. Other times, you may have been put out of the church. And there's some people who have the question about if they've been called as a prophet or not. Well, if you read that book, you will know if you're a prophet or not. But then the Lord recently gave me another test. He had a messenger give me an assignment. And basically what I'm about to present is a part of the thesis for that assignment. And this is called the death of a false prophet. And it may sound kind of harsh because we don't put false prophets to death anymore. And that's a part of the problem. A lot of people take the Lord too lightly. But there's nothing new under the sun. So I'm going to show you some things from the Old Testament, New Testament, and maybe even some things in modern day life regarding how people are taking the Lord too lightly by using his name in vain. Feeding themselves on the Lord's sheep as if there's not a consequence to pay. Now, some people start off as being false prophets. Others have a legitimate calling from the Lord. But Jesus said, many are called, few are chosen. And some people, they go astray for various reasons. So it is quite possible for a person to have a legitimate calling from the Lord, for example, as a prophet or an apostle, and for that individual to go astray. So there are some people who have a legitimate calling from the Lord. They consider themselves to be a prophet of the Lord, but based on the things they have done along the line, they have become false prophets. And some of them don't even know it. In addition to raising the willingness, as a part of the preparation, the Lord also had me read two books. And they're by Sam Medina called Seven Keys to Prophetic Maturity. And Seven Keys to Prophetic Protocol. There are some prophets who, they're not false prophets, they've received some errant training, and as a result, they're basically errant prophets. There's still hope for them. One of the things about Seven Keys to Prophetic Maturity is whereas Raised in the Wilderness talks about that cave experience where you're wondering if you're a prophet or not, well, there comes a point when you will know if you're a prophet of the Lord. But once you're a prophet, you also have to become a mature prophet. And also part of how people become errant prophets is because they're not adhering to prophetic protocols. And that's one of the good things about Seven Keys to Prophetic Protocol. Now, all three books that I mentioned are biblically based. But there are a lot of people who either don't read the Bible, to include prophets, and nowadays prophets need to read the Bible, who don't read the Bible, or the Holy Spirit hasn't quite led them down a journey to reveal certain things to them. So I mentioned about death of a false prophet. I take prophecy seriously. 
because I know that a true word from the Lord can change a person's life, whether to get them to repent of their sins and get in alignment with the will of the Lord, or a person who's following the will of the Lord, for them to get the true word that takes them to what we can call a breakthrough. A false prophecy, on the other hand, does the opposite. It kind of aligns people with the devil, gets them ensnared into his plans for their lives, which is always contrary to the Lord. It keeps some people stuck when they should be moving forward, or it keeps them going to the left or right when they should be going in another direction. So I take those kind of things seriously, and the Lord does too. And in my study of scriptures, I have never found a scripture where the Lord had mercy on a false prophet. But some people, they want to make the distinction between Old and New Testament. <laughs> oh boy. In Malachi 3.6, God said, I am the Lord and I change not. So we don't want to make a distinction between Old and New Testament. We have to be careful. Also in Hebrews 13.8, it tells us that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. So even though false prophets don't get stoned to death as in times past, there is still a death penalty for it. And a part of the reason why I speak out against false prophets, and I try not to focus too much on false prophets because one of the reasons for writing Raised in the Wilderness was exposing people to what true prophetic ministry is like and also the other two books, Seven Keys to Prophetic Maturity and Prophetic Protocol, is when you're exposed to what the truth looks like, when you're presented with a lie, it makes it much more easy to recognize. Yes, the Bible tells us not to be ignorant of the devil's devices, lest he gets an advantage of us, but it doesn't necessarily mean we need to spend time studying how the devil operates. When you study how the Lord operates, the devil's going to throw things at you and the Lord most likely, excuse me, will expose those things beforehand. Or when the devil comes at you, you'll realize, okay, I hear scriptures, but this sounds like a Luke 4, 1 through 13 kind of thing where I'm hearing the word of God, but like Jesus said, my sheep know my voice and another they will not follow. So you may hear the word of the Lord, but it's coming with another voice. And I'll start off with um, Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 5. And the Lord said, If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and give it thee a sign or a wonder. And I pause. The Lord mentioned about a prophet or a dreamer of dream. Or dreamer of dreams. So there are people who have dreams, a lot of them, but it doesn't mean that they are, they are a prophet. And the Lord makes this distinction here. And the sign or wonder come to pass... Whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods, which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. So the Lord is speaking about a prophet or a dreamer of dream who makes a prediction and it comes to pass, but then that same person speaks about going after another god. In some cases, the prophet or dreamer of dreams, or just a regular person, so to speak, may not necessarily tell you something that comes to pass and overtly tells you about going after another God, sometimes more covert. The Lord said, Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God proveth you to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. So the Lord lets us know, just because someone makes a prediction and it comes to pass, doesn't necessarily mean that person is serving him. If that person starts pointing you to another God, that means the Lord is testing you, whether you love him or another God. And a lot of false prophets, they will erect themselves up as being a God for you to follow them. And it will get to the point where they will want you to disobey the word of the Lord to follow what they are saying. Some will even contradict scriptures to get you to follow what they are saying. A great example, 1 Kings 13. The Lord gave clear instructions to a prophet from Judah to go to Bethel. 
a Bethelite prophet, lied to him by saying an angel had a word that was contrary to what the Lord had told him. And as the Bible says in many, many places, even Balaam, a soothsayer, said that God is not a man that he should repent, and he doesn't lie. Samuel the seer said the same thing, that God does not lie. So if the Lord tells you something, he's not going to have someone else come along and change that word. So if you receive a direct revelation from the Lord, and someone comes along and tells you something contrary, that is a sign of a false prophet. So the first thing, ensure that you know that you have heard from the Lord. And when you do, anyone who comes with something contrary is testing you to see whether you love God or someone else. And it continues, You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear Him. And there are times when false prophets will try to induce a spirit of fear, when the Bible tells us that God hasn't given us a spirit of fear. But So they will try to use pressure tactics to get you to do something as if the Lord is telling you to do it through them when that is not the case. So just be very careful. And it says, and keep his commandments and obey his voice. So again, the Lord's voice and not someone else pretending to serve him. And ye shall serve him and cleave unto him, stick to the Lord. And if that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be, correction, and that prophet or that dream of dreams shall be put to death because he or she hath spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God. So here we have in Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 5, a prophet or dream of dreams makes a prediction. It comes to pass. But then that same person tries leading you to another God. That person is deserving of the death penalty. And the Lord will allow things like this to put you to the test. So, you know, mention about killing false prophets. Won't be able to eradicate all false prophets because the Lord will allow some to continue and there are various reasons. And one of the reasons why I speak out against false prophets is because a time will come when the false prophet with lying signs and wonders will deceive many. And if we let a lot of these people who are pretending to be prophets right now get away with it, whenever that false prophet comes, the false prophet, it's going to be even more hard for people because of what we in this generation right now are tolerating. Now, I'm saying these scriptures, and there are false prophets out there who they'll tell you these scriptures themselves. And it's just one of those things where it is almost unfathomable for a person to believe in the Lord, quote scriptures, they'll, they're hearers of the word, they're speakers of the word, but not doers of the word. In Deuteronomy 18, starting verse 20, the Lord said, But the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. So to mention about seven keys to prophetic protocol, that's one of the things it covers about not just declaring a thing because you perceive something or the Lord communicated something to you, but for him to actually command you to communicate it. Proverbs tells us, an inheritance claimed too soon will not be blessed in the end. So even receiving a right message from the Lord, if you deliver too soon, it could be counterproductive. It could also invite excessive spiritual warfare that may deter a person from truly walking into their promised land. So it's not only being not being a false prophet, but being a true prophet who's doing things in accordance with the Lord's will. So his timing. And if thou say in thine heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord had not spoken? And this is key. 
when a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if that thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is a thing which the Lord hath not spoken, but the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously. Thou shalt not be afraid of him. So in Deuteronomy 13, the false prophet says something, it comes to pass, tries leading you to another god. In this case, the Lord is letting you know another sign of a false prophet is one who makes a declaration in the Lord's name or even just insinuates that message from the Lord, but it does not come to pass. And one of the things is, in today's society, we're just too tolerant of people making false proclamations that do not come to pass, and then we keep on giving them more chances. Death penalty. Now, I mentioned that when I was inspired to write Raising the Willingness, that <laughs> it, it, should, it should have sent a clear signal to the kingdom of darkness that you do not try to pull certain things on me because... <laughs> I know what the truth looks like, so it's going to be easy for me to spot a lie. One of the things about when the devil inspires someone to do something, they may think it's the Lord, and they may think the Lord has not warned you. And another way we're going to find out how to discern between a true and a false prophet. is basically when the Lord tells you something beforehand. I mentioned 1 Kings 13. But I'm actually going to go to Jeremiah, Jeremiah 28. There is nothing new under the sun. There were false prophets many years ago, and there are false prophets today. And they'll actually be bold enough to be among true prophets, which makes them a bit harder to spot but it's one of the things where true prophets have to be more discerning. Not only that. Not only that, but true prophets have to be confrontational when it comes to false prophets. One of the most confrontational persons in the Bible was Jesus. When you look at the logo for social alum ministries, you will see a feather and you will see a hammer. So there are times when I come across and it's going to be gentle. Other times, I'm going to drop the hammer. And Jesus, same thing. When Jesus was speaking about children, he was gentle. But when you look in Matthew 23, when he was speaking about the Pharisees and scribes, he ripped into them. Whitewashed sepulcher or tomb, that wasn't a compliment. Calling them a generation of vipers, that was not a compliment. So there are certain things where, even though the Lord is loving, He didn't tolerate certain things. And we have to hate what God hates. In Deuteronomy 28, it starts, or correction, Jeremiah 28, And it came to pass the same year in the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the fourth year and the fifth month, that Hananiah, the son of Azor the prophet, which was of Gibeon, spake unto me in the house of the Lord, in the presence of the priests, and of all the people, saying. I pause for a second. So Jeremiah is saying the prophet Hananiah was declaring something in the house of the Lord, in the presence of the priests, and all the people. Hananiah was a false prophet. But here he is making bold proclamations in the house of the Lord, in front of the priests, in front of the prophet Jeremiah, and all the people. And many false prophets are doing the same thing today, boldly making false procl proclamations in the name of the Lord out in public. So the prophet Hananiah said, 
Also note, I said the prophet Hananiah, and there are two types of prophets, prophets of the Lord and prophets of the devil. So just because a person has a title doesn't mean it's a person who was ordained from the Lord or that they're actually working for him. So he said, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. Within two full years will I bring again into this place all the vessels of the Lord's house that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, took away from this place and carried them to Babylon. And I will bring again this place, Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, with all the captives of Judah that went into Babylon, saith the Lord, for I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. When you listen to all of that, on the surface, it sounds good. The Lord's going to return the vessels back into his house, break the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar, and it says within two full years. One of the key things is, when you receive a prophecy, or when others are receiving prophecy, it is good to write it down. If a person says something is going to happen within two years, like this, then you hold that person to the standard. One of the things false prophets will do is that they will, for example, if they give you a time frame, if it doesn't come to pass, they may say, well, you lack faith, or you should have done this, and they'll make excuses. That's not how prophecy works. If there are conditions associated with it, you give those conditions up front. When the Lord had his encounter with King Solomon, he told him what he would do, but he said that if he followed him the way his father David did. So the Lord gave him a condition and he stated up front. The Lord doesn't play games. And if the Lord says something's going to happen in two years, it's going to happen in two years. Because this is one of those things where people need to repent. So everything sounded good. So it, it may have seemed as if the only way to determine whether this was a true word from the Lord was to wait for two years, but not so fast. Then the prophet Jeremiah said unto Hananiah, or the prophet Hananiah, in the presence of the priests and in all the presence of the people that stood in the house of the Lord. Even the prophet Jeremiah said, Amen. The Lord do so. The Lord performed thy words, which thou hast prophesied. He could have said prophylied. To bring again the vessels of the Lord's house, and all that is carried away captive from Babylon into this place. Nevertheless, hear thou now this word that I speak in thine ears, and in the ears of all the people. The prophets that have been before me, and been before thee of old, prophesied, both against many countries, and against great kingdoms, and of war, and of evil, and of pestilence. The prophet which prophesieth of peace, when the word of the prophet shall come to pass, then shall the prophet be known that the Lord hath truly sent him. Again, the prophet which prophesieth of peace, when the word of the Lord shall come to pass, as in Deuteronomy 18, 20 through 22. Then shall the prophet be known that the Lord had truly sent him. So it's one thing to be a prophet of the Lord. It's another thing to be a prophet of the Lord whom he sent. Then Hananiah, the prophet, took the yoke of the prophet Jeremiah's neck and break it. Note the Bible calling both of them a prophet. But only one is truly representing the Lord. So again, do not be fooled by people's titles. Judas was an apostle. I venture to say Judas is in hell. <laughs> and Hananiah spake in the presence of all the people, saying, Thus saith the Lord. And let me pause for a second. So he said something 
that wasn't from the Lord. No way. Then Jeremiah said something, which was basically telling him, look man, you may want to shut up. But rather than shutting up and maybe going in a corner somewhere, he's going to speak again. And Hananiah spake in the presence of all the people, saying, Thus saith the Lord. Again, just because a person is saying something's coming from the Lord, doesn't mean it's coming from the Lord. 1 John 4, 1, tells of beloved, Do not believe every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because there are many false prophets that have gone out in the world. Even so, will I break the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, from the neck of all nations within the space of two full years. He just can't stop himself. And the prophet Jeremiah went his way. Now, Jeremiah didn't need to wait two full years to know if the Lord had spoken. The Lord did not need to tell Jeremiah on that day that Hananiah was lying. Why? Because when we go to the previous chapter, Jeremiah 27, the Lord had already told Jeremiah something that should not let him know that if anyone said anything contrary to these words, that that person was a liar. In Jeremiah 27, starting in verse 14, this is a continuing part of a prophecy Jeremiah had given. Therefore, hearken not unto the words of the prophets that speak unto you, saying, Ye shall not serve the king of Babylon, for they prophesy a lie unto you. For I have not sent them, saith the Lord, yet they prophesy a lie in my name, that I might drive you out, and that ye might perish, ye and the prophets that prophesy unto you. Also, I spake to the priests and to all these people, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Hearken not unto the words of your prophets that prophesy unto you, saying, Behold, the vessels of the Lord shall now shortly be brought again from Babylon, for they prophesy a lie unto you. So I say that again, with a little less sauce. Jeremiah was saying in, in verse 16, Also I spake to the priest and to all this people. So all those priests who heard the word that Hananiah was saying should have known based on this prophecy that or question, all the people who heard what Jeremiah said here should know that when Hananiah spoke later that he was lying. Also, I spake to the priest and to all this people, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Hearken not, do not listen, to the words of your prophets that prophesy unto you, saying, Behold, the vessels of the Lord's house shall now shortly be brought again from Babylon, for they prophesy a lie unto you. I can't begin to count the amount of times when the Lord has told me something about someone, and then the person came, just like Hananiah did, and said the same thing that the Lord had warned me about, and then had the nerve to expect me to believe. I'm by no means stupid. And the same way I have been taught to listen to the Lord as opposed to people, listen to the Lord. Now, when I mentioned about this being a thesis, this is an assignment, the Lord sent a messenger, or had a messenger deliver this assignment to me. But it was a messenger I could trust. I have a previous video out there about dissecting prophecies. And in the example I gave was things to look for to tell whether a prophecy is true. And I'll give you a practical example. If you order something, and I'll say, for example, from Amazon.com, and it tells you that a package is due in a couple of days, and for example, it's coming through UPS. Well, the source of the message, so to speak, is Amazon. Similarly with the prophecy, you want to ensure the source is from the Lord, not from the devil and not from a person's flesh. Because I've seen both all three types of prophecies. So you know it's coming from Amazon, 
You know it's coming via UPS, and you know when it's coming. The day. On the day you're expecting the package, you see a vehicle pull up in front of your house. But it's a food truck. And a guy comes out wearing a delivery uniform. And he has a package in his hand. He comes to your door, and you realize that he's dressed like a UPS delivery man, but he's wearing a FedEx badge. All these things are kind of suspicious because it's not only the source, but also the messenger. The vehicle came in suspicious, not an official delivery vehicle. The messenger looked like kind of just slept on an outfit. But also you see the package and there's excessive postage because the person doesn't want it returned to him or her. That's suspicious also. You further inspect the package and it doesn't have a return address. Even more, you may see suspicious substances on the outside of the package. Those are telling you that you don't even need to open that package. Return to sender. Burn in place. Do not let it into your house. And there's some messages. Do not receive those things into your system. Don't even read it to determine if it's true. Based on the things that you see on the outside, don't mess with it. So here you have Jeremiah having delivered a prophecy beforehand, saying if any prophet is talking about things being returned within a short period of time, that that prophet is lying. And then here you have Hananiah saying the same thing that the Lord had warned him about. One of the things I've noticed, many people receive true prophecies and as opposed to writing them down, like we're instructed to in Habakkuk 2, 2 through 3, is that people will just forget about it. And that's one of the ways where it is hard to hold a prophet accountable if the things they say, you don't write it down to hold them accountable. And one of the things writing it down will do is it will give you clarification regarding what was said. Because you can also ask prophet, okay, I'm discerning this, or ask additional questions to see if the Lord has anything else to say. Jesus had mentioned about destroying the temple within three days and about rebuilding it. And people thought he was talking about the temple where they were making sacrifices, but he was speaking about his own body. So sometimes the way the Lord speaks, we may misinterpret it. But when the Lord speaks clearly to you, and you know, write that thing down, and do not let anyone else come and tell you differently. Especially after the Lord has warned you. And that's one of the ways. Like I mentioned, death of a false prophet. So after um, Hananiah had spoken, he had broken the yoke of Jeremiah's neck. Let me start reading verse 12 of Jeremiah 28. Then the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah the prophet, after Hananiah the prophet had broken the yoke from off the neck of Jeremiah, saying, now this is the Lord speaking, Go and tell Hananiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Thou hast broken the yokes of wood, but thou shalt make for them yokes of iron. So Hananiah, the false prophet, had broken the wooden yoke of Jeremiah's neck, and because of that, now the Lord's going to put on yokes of iron. When you follow a false prophet, you're going to make things worse for yourself. For thus said the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I have put a yoke of iron upon the neck of all these nations, that they may serve Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and they shall serve him. And I have given him the beast of the field also. Then said the prophet Jeremiah to Hananiah the prophet. Again, the title prophet, but only one of them is serving the Lord. Hear now, Hananiah, the Lord hath not sent thee, but thou makest this people to trust a lie. 
How often do you hear people calling out other prophets, saying the Lord has not sent you, but you're making people to trust a lie? I'll read it again. The Lord hath not sent thee, but thou makest this people to trust a lie. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will cast thee from off the face of the earth. This year thou shalt die, because thou hast taught rebellion against the Lord. I pause for a second. This teaching rebellion against the Lord, any kind of a rebellion against the Lord is witchcraft. We see in 1 Samuel 15, where Samuel told King Saul that rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft. So the Lord didn't send Jeremiah to tell Hananiah, look, you need to stop this stuff. The Lord had no mercy on him. Now, at the beginning, it mentioned that it was during the fifth month. In verse 17 states, So Hananiah the prophet died the same year in the seventh month. So in two years, Hananiah died because he taught rebellion against the Lord. Now, there are some people where the Lord allows them to live longer, but it doesn't mean that hell is going to be any cooler for them because if they do not repent, that is where they're going. And basically, they may be calling themselves prophets, but they're messengers of Satan. In Matthew 23, the Lord spoke about the Pharisees and scribes being children of hell, which meant even though they were serving God, they were on their way to hell if they didn't repent. Another example regarding prophets is in 1 Kings 18. And this is confrontation between the prophet Elijah and the 450 prophets of Baal. And one thing Elijah said to the Israelites is how long will they waver between two opinions? Meaning, how long will they waver between serving the true and the living God and other gods such as Baal? Which is reminiscent of when Joshua said, on, as for me and my house, well, on this day, choose which God you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So he was also saying, or Elijah was saying this, basically the same thing here, where the Israelites need to choose, again, which God they were going to serve. When the angel of the Lord Gabriel appeared before Zechariah, and even the book of Malachi talks about one coming, who would be in the spirit of Elijah, and that was John the Baptist. John the Baptist was another confrontational prophet. He even told King Herod that it was wrong for him to marry Herodias, his brother's wife. He was calling people out for being in sin. He wasn't praying for them. He wasn't tolerating them. He was confronting them. You brood of vipers, who warned you of the coming wrath? John the Baptist was on fire when he saw the Pharisees and Sadducees coming down his path. A bunch of holy men were all others could see. But John the Baptist said, the axe is already at the root of the tree. So back to um, 1 Kings 18, the prophet Elijah on Mount Carmel once they had that showdown and Elijah showed that he was serving the true and living God and the people repented and started turning their hearts towards the Lord, he didn't just tell those 450 false prophets to pack up. Here's what happened to them. Starting verse, or in verse 40 of 1 Kings 18. And Elijah said unto them, Take the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape. And they took them. And Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slew them there. So none of them escaped. Not one. 
because they were leading people to other gods. And Elijah was not a person to play with. A lot of people talk about how Elijah ran from Jezebel. That's one of the burning questions I have in my life. But when King Azahiah was about to die, and he sent his men to go inquire of the God of Ekron, an angel told Elijah, and Elijah headed those men off and told them to go back and tell the king that he was going to die. The king sent two different companies of a captain with 50 men. Elijah called down fire from heaven and burned those men. So Elijah was not someone to play with. And it begs the question, how is it Elijah didn't do the same thing with Jezebel? But a part of prophetic protocol is being led by the Holy Spirit. There are some things the Lord will allow, other things he won't. So where is Elijah killed those 450 false prophets? Where he killed two companies of the men who tried to detain him? He ran from Jezebel. But that didn't mean he was a coward. Now I'll also mention a part of this is about my thesis on a project the Lord gave me. The Lord is great about preparing us for tests. Before David faced Goliath, he had faced a lion and a bear, and he killed them. And he had a confidence in his skills and his confidence in his God to deliver him from that situation. Which is why when David faced Goliath, when everyone else was cowering from Goliath, David confronted the giant and killed him. And I've heard said many times, it is hard to conquer what you do not confront. I say it again, it is hard to conquer what you do not confront. But with David, we also see how David ran from King Saul. He could have killed him. I mean, King Saul was among those who was cowering from Goliath. In fact, King Saul should have known better than to even try to mess with David. But there's one point when David was in a cave and he cut off a piece of King Saul's skirt and the Holy Spirit convicted him where he could basically do no more. So I think about not touching the Lord's anointed. It's kind of like how Saul, or correction, um, Elijah would not kill Jezebel, but he later prophesied about her death. And she died the same way where when Jehu confronted her, she was thrown over by the eunuchs and she was trampled by horses and dogs licked her blood. So for everyone, the day of judgment is coming. As was the case with King Saul, the Lord did not allow David to kill Saul and take over as king. But it wasn't because David lacked the courage. So there's a difference between the Holy Spirit letting you confront things and you not confronting it versus the Holy Spirit not letting you confront certain things for various reasons. But it's time for prophets to become confrontational and apostles to become confrontational. The way Jeremiah was with around Hananiah, there are times when people, what I like to call faking the funk, there are times when you see people and they're faking it. When you discern that they're not who they're pretending to be, by all means, call them out. Call them out. In Jeremiah 23, the Lord talks about, Woe be unto the shepherd who scatters sheep of my pasture. In Ezekiel 34, it talks about heavy shepherding, how the Lord is against the, the shepherds who are feeding themselves on his flock, the pastors who are doing so. And that's one of the things mentioned in um, Raising the Wilderness, rogue reformers rallying the remnant, was that if a prophet is assigned to a church, that prophet's ultimate loyalty should be to the Lord and not to the pastor. Yes, respect the pastor's authority, but do not allow the pastor to lead the Lord's sheep astray. And that's part of the reason why I call prophets sheepdogs. 
and even that it was interesting how the Lord um, <laughs> led me to that because one of the books behind me talks about lessons of a sheepdog. And that's what the Lord used me to inspire about calling prophets sheepdogs. Prophets are like sheepdogs because sheepdogs, they protect the sheep and they confront the wolves. They don't get in bed with the wolves. They confront them. They kill them. All this here may be sounding harsh. You may be thinking, oh, this is all Old Testament stuff. Well, a little bit more for you. In Micah 3, let you know that the Lord isn't playing. Starting in verse 8. Thus saith the Lord, concerning the prophets that make my people err, that bite with their teeth and cry peace. And he that put it not into their mouths, that even prepare war against them. Therefore, night shall be unto you that ye shall not have a vision, and it shall be dark unto you, that ye shall not divine. And the sun shall go down over the prophets, and the day shall be dark over them. Then shall the seers be ashamed, and the diviners confounded. Yea, they shall all cover their lips, for there is no answer of God. But I, but truly, I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord and of judgment and of might. I'll pause there. A lot of times we're, get, we're stuck on the gifts and callings of the Lord or without repentance. True. But you can be shut down. You cannot have a vision. You cannot have any more dreams. At least not from the Lord. He can shut down the devil too. So whether you're a prophet, seer, diviner, if the Lord doesn't give you a form of communication, you'll be in the dark. As I mentioned about a minute ago, you may be saying this is all Old Testament stuff. We're on the grace. Okay. I mentioned before, Hebrews 13, 8, that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. In Acts 5, we're told about Ananias and Sapphira. And I won't read it. But take note that Ananias and his wife Sapphira both lied to Peter. And the apostle said, they weren't lying to men, they were lying to God. And because of that, both of them died. They died a couple of hours apart. First Ananias, because he lied. And then when Peter asked his wife, is what Ananias said is true, he basically let her know that men who had taken away his hus her husband were going to take away her carcass too. And she died for lying to the Holy Spirit. That's New Testament. The same Peter had another issue. And I'll go to Acts 8 and I'll read verses 5 through 24. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them. And many were taken with palsies, and that were lame were healed. Jesus said that 
basically the kingdom of darkness is not divided and how can Satan cast out Satan and I see here about Philip he was casting out unclean spirits one of the things that make this harder nowadays is if quote unquote ministers of Christ are actually serving the devil then how can they cast out the devil and there was great joy in the city but there was a certain man called Simon which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria giving out that himself was some great one I was recently inspired to do a video called Witchcraft and Christianity, which addresses this. So here you have Simon, a sorcerer, who is putting himself in an exalted position. And there are many people who are calling themselves ministers of Christ. And basically, they have seen an opportunity to, for some kind of self-aggrandizement, where they're exalting themselves into a position sometimes for money, sometimes for power, a variety of reasons. And they may be using the word of the Lord, calling on the name of Jesus, but they're not serving him. And a part of that is, he did not call them. And it continues, to whom they all gave heed. So because of the things that he did, like false signs and wonders, they would listen to him. From the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the great power of God. And there are many people today who seem as if they're ministers of Christ. They seem as if they're flowing in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, as listed in 1 Corinthians 12, but they're actually using demonic powers. And to him, they had regard... And to him, they had regard. In the Old Testament, we're commanded to regard not those who have familiar spirits. Because of that long time, he had bewitched them with sorceries. But when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also. And that's good. But the New Testament also tells us that devils believe in Christ. They hear his name and tremble. But still, they don't follow Christ. But they believe. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and one and... Con Say it again. He continued with Philip and wandered. Behold, and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. That right there is pointing to what was drawing Simon. Simon had exalted himself. He had used sorcery. So here it is, you have Philip coming in, doing these signs and wonders, driving out demons. So that spoke of power. So you can tell that Simon was like a bug that was drawn to light. So he continued with Philip and wandered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Which is reminiscent of Jesus in John 6 when he spoke about people following him. But basically not because they were interested in the word of God, but because he had fed them. So they wanted bread. Now, when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter 
and John, who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was not fallen upon none of them. Only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw that through laying on the <laughs> laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. So Simon the sorcerer saw all these signs and wonders, believed in Jesus. When he saw about the power of the Holy Ghost, he was willing to offer money for it. And if you ever heard the term simony, it originates from Simon. Saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. There are some people who are practicing witchcraft. They practice it before going to church, and now they've taken it into the church, and they don't truly love the Lord. Let me rephrase that. They don't love the Lord. They love the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And that's what they want. So they can use it for their selfish desires. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of the God. Many ministers, and I use the term loosely, their hearts are not right in the sight of the Lord. One of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is the discerning of spirits. One of the things I've noticed, I've come across quite a few people who operate strongly in that gift, but they don't have a voice. Some don't quite understand it, may say, well, I can walk into a room and I can sense that something's going on or I feel this heaviness or I get this, around certain people, I get depressed or I get bad vibes about people and they're not quite sure what to do with that gift. Which is part of the reason why stewardship and mentorship are so important. The right mentorship. Because the devil, one of the ways people become false prophets is if the devil can get someone when they're young, either in age or in their walk with the Lord and he can use their gifts for demonic purposes, he will do that. But the discerning of spirits is such a critical gift to have at this hour, but more important, people need to speak out. We know, that, for example, prophecy is a gift that involves oration. You speak it out or you write it out. You have to proclaim things. Well, with discerning of spirits, if you know something isn't quite right, then you have to put those kind of things out. There's some churches where a person showed up, someone with the gift or a strong gift of discerning of spirits can detect that something was, was not quite right with this person, but never said anything. So those are the gifts of discerning of spirits. You have to speak out. And I know there are some environments where if you tell someone that you had a bad feeling, they will talk you out of it. So it's also important to have the right kind of leadership who can mentor you with the gift, and help you steward that gift. And would also take what you have to say whenever you provide feedback. And it continues. Peter saying to Simon, Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. And this is important. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. So Peter, he perceived those things via the Holy Spirit. He perceived it. There's times when you perceive things in another person and you'll confront the individual and the individual will deny it. What I said earlier, believe the Lord. When he shows you something and you know it's coming from him, believe him.
It doesn't matter if a person denies it or not. Believe the Lord. The Holy Spirit has many purposes. We know him as a comforter. And a part of that, he shows us things to come. He will warn us of danger. And we have to listen to him. Then answered Simon and said, Pray ye to the Lord for me. Hmm. Pray ye to the Lord for me that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. And a key thing to reiterate here, back in verse 20, when Peter looked at him, he said, Thy money perish with thee. Thy money perish with thee. He didn't just say, your money perish, but your money perish with thee. So as was the case, when Peter told Sapphira that she was going to die, that's what Peter was saying here. You and your money can die. Peter was not playing around. And this is New Covenant. So even though Peter wasn't stoning Simon to death here, and also under Old Testament, the Lord said, Suffer not a witch to live. So he realized the power of Peter's words, which was why he asked Peter to pray for him. And as I start to wind down, I present another example in Acts 13 with another apostle. Starting in verse 4. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Cilicia. And from thence they sailed to Cyprus. And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had also John to their minister. And when they had gone through the Isle of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet. A certain sorcerer, a false prophet. So what we're being told here is sorcery is the same thing as being a false prophet. They found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet. Remember that. A certain sorcerer, a false prophet. A Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, which was the deputy of the country, or which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man who called for Barnabas and Saul, the Apostle Paul, and desired to hear the word of God. So Sergius Paulus, the proconsul, he wanted to hear the word of God. So he called for Barnabas and Paul. But Elymas, the sorcerer, the false prophet, who for so, or correction, for so his name by interpretation withstood them. So Sergius Paulus called Barnabas, Barnabas and Paul, but the sorcerer, the false prophet, opposed them. One of the functions of a false prophet is to prevent the word of the Lord from truly going forth. And that's one of the reasons not to tolerate them. Seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes upon him. Do you think... Saul is going to pray for him. Ask him to stop. Let's continue. And said, O oh, full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil. 
Nowadays you call someone child of the devil. Some people may be saying, aren't we all children of God? We may be all, or we are the Lord's creations, but not necessarily his children. You remember scripture telling us, come out from among them and I will receive you as my sons and daughters. So if you're having fellowship with unfruitful works of darkness, not a child. And he said again, O oh, full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell upon him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. The Apostle Paul saw the resistance, did not tolerate it, and he commanded for Elymas, the sorcerer, the false prophet, to be blind for a season. And this is a part of the New Testament. Do not tolerate evil. Do not tolerate false prophets. I mentioned that Elymas, the sorcerer, was also a false prophet. Well, in Galatians 5, Starting verse 19, and the Apostle Paul also wrote this. He said, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft. And idolatry and witchcraft, they're synonymous in that a person who practices witchcraft is more concerned about himself or the people he or she may be serving, which means they're not concerned about the will of God, but like Elymas, they will oppose the will of God, which is idolatry because they're advancing the devil's agenda as opposed to God's agenda. Hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, Strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Witchcraft, idolatry, that sorcery, false prophet, not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, I mentioned that there are times when the Lord will allow false prophets to stay around. But if the Lord tells you, in a sense, to command something negative on a false prophet, then do it, because that means a person is being judged. Now, I mentioned with David and King Saul, how Saul fled from, or David fled from Saul's persecution. Sometimes the Lord will allow that. He may allow someone to afflict you, someone from the enemy, to afflict you, and it's for a reason. In the case of Paul, he had a messenger of Satan. So you may have a messenger of Satan assigned to your ministry, assigned to your life. In some cases, that messenger of Satan will actually teach you about the kingdom of darkness so that you won't be ignorant of the devil's devices. Because the more that person or those individuals attack you, 
is the more you learn about the things the enemy does. But the Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12, starting in verse 7, And lest should I be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, that there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. So the Apostle Paul, who wrote most of the books in the New Testament, which meant he received a lot of revelations, he said, lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations that he was given a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan. So that messenger of Satan was to prevent him from becoming full of pride. And it's part of the reason why he was persecuted. If you've been persecuted, for example, by a false prophet, and the Lord has called you as a prophet, one of the things the Lord is showing you is what you should not do. And also so that you will develop an attitude of no tolerance for false prophets. So, for example, if you've never been persecuted, and you hear someone else saying that he or she's being persecuted by a false prophet, you may think lightly of it. But if you've gone through that stuff yourself, it will change your attitude. It will change your attitude. And it continues. For this thing, I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, Will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me? Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So the Apostle Paul embraced his persecutions. One of the things I mentioned in um, Raised in the Wilderness, there's an entire chapter dedicated to Jezebel. And as a prophet, at some point in time, you're going to get exposed to, I was call, some form of Jezebelic resistance. It may be early in your walk as a prophet to try to discourage you from speaking out. When you study in 1 Kings and also through 2 Kings, it talks about Jezebel. I didn't cover it when I mentioned 1 Kings 18. When Elijah had the encounter with Obadiah, he spoke about how Jezebel was killing the Lord's prophets. And I also firmly believe that Jezebel gave some of the Lord's prophets a choice whether to serve her or die. And some were faithful to the Lord, which is why they were killed. Others ran for their lives. In 1 Kings 19, when the Lord was sending Elijah back, one of his assignments was to go and anoint Elisha as his replacement. Elijah spent some time in the wilderness. Yet, Elijah wasn't someone to play with. And he went there because of Jezebel. But during that time, The Lord mentioned that he had 7,000 people, 7,000 men, who had not bowed their knees to Baal. I implore you, if the Lord has called you as a prophet, that you do not bow your knee 
to any other God. If the Lord hasn't called you yet, but you have a feeling inside that you are supposed to be a prophet, don't make any presumption to start walking out, start making business cards, calling yourself a prophet. Don't operate in presumption. You may be among the 7,000, so to speak, that the Lord is keeping in reserve. Or you may be one of those in the wilderness where your voice is being heard like the Lord plans on using you. And there are many reasons why the Lord keeps a person in the wilderness. In some cases, it's for insulation. In other cases, it may be isolation so that you don't pick up from the lot of errant things that are going on in prophetic ministries today. And include things that are being taught in churches, even on so-called Christian television, that are contrary to the word of the Lord. So the Apostle Paul, he endured persecution. But he didn't play when it was time to render judgment. And the things I've been saying, if you've been thinking it's harsh, the Apostle Paul also wrote in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 5, To deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. This is New Testament. Sometimes you have to command the deliverance of someone over to Satan for the destruction of his or her flesh, so that their spirit may be saved. Sometimes that's what it takes for a person to have a wake-up call to repent of his or her wicked ways. And if they persist, then when they stand before the Lord, they will go straight to hell and they will have no complaints. So as in um, Micah 3, 5 through 8, with a command for darkness on the eyes of the prophets and the seers who are telling lies in the Lord's name, causing people to err, here in New Testament, we see um, Elymas, he was blind for a season. The Apostle Paul, talking about delivering people unto Satan for the destruction of their flesh, so that their spirit might be saved. This stuff is nothing to play with. And it is time for prophets to start speaking out, speaking up for the Lord, and not cower. Do not run from Jezebel or anyone else. In 2 Timothy um, 3, verses 8 through 9, it states, Now, as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the fate. And when a person becomes a false prophet, that person is usually reprobate. And that's part of the reason why false prophets, they have a hard time repenting. But you have to confront them. You have to put them in their place. You have to stand on the side of the Lord. With um, Genesis and Jambres, who withstood Moses, they were able to replicate the first two plagues in Egypt. But they couldn't end those plagues because the Lord had brought them on. When there was a plague of the boils, those magicians were also afflicted. So the Lord didn't spare them. And it continues, But they shall pr proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. A lot of people want to pray for a lot of things. Oh, pray for these false prophets. You need to expose them so that people can get away from them, so that people do not fall into their snares. In John 10, Jesus spoke about hirelings who let the wolves in, which is part of the reason why we need true sheepdogs, true prophets out there, the watchmen on the walls, who are not going to let the wolves in. And if a pastor want to invite a false prophet into the church, that that prophet 
will oppose the pastor. And if that pastor allows a false prophet to come into church, that that prophet, I call the church prophet, will be willing to call the false prophet out publicly so that no one receives from him or her. Like I mentioned earlier, a false prophet is going to lead people to another god. In some cases, a false prophet may be trying to invite followers to him or herself. Elijah, when he was on Mount Carmel, he asked people, how long will they waver between two opinions? He was pointing people to God. John the Baptist did the same thing, which is part of the reason why when Jesus stepped into his ministry, John said that he must decrease so that Jesus can increase. So, but they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men. Now, if you think everything I've said is mean-spirited and may not seem Christ-like, well, let's go to Revelation chapter 2, starting in verse 18. And unto the angel of the church in Tyre write, These things saith the Son of God. So these things say Jesus, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou suffereth that woman Jezebel which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts and will give unto every one of you according to your works. Those are the words of the Lord. If you have a red letter Bible, those words are in red. Those words are in the New Testament. Those words are in the New Covenant. So yes, this is about the death of a false prophet. In Revelation 21, verse 8, it states, But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers remember earlier Elymas the sorcerer a false prophet so and sorcerers and idolaters false prophets fall in the category also and all liars false prophets fall in the category also shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and which brimstone which is the second death. I mentioned about Minister Logo earlier, where there's a feather, which is a writing quill, which is something the Lord has me do a lot of, writing. But then there's also the hammer. Some people know me primarily for the soft side. But there's also a hammer side, and I have no problem being like Hananiah or Jeremiah telling someone that they're going to die or that they're risking death or that if they don't repent, they're going to go to hell. Do they have to listen? No. One of the things about prophetic, prophetic protocol is how you deliver a message. And think of 
Ezekiel 3 and also 33, when the Lord called Ezekiel as a watchman and then when he renewed his calling as a watchman. The Lord used the analogy for watchman, who if the watchman warned the people and they didn't listen, that their blood would be on their own hands. But if the watchman saw danger coming and didn't warn the people and the people perished, then blood would be on the watchman's hands. Every prophet, it is not your responsibility to make people hear the message. Your responsibility is to deliver the message once, and that's it. Anything, anything above delivering the same message once is like putting extra postage on a stamp. It raises questions. You only have to declare it once. When Jonah went through Nineveh, he told them that in 40 days, the city would be destroyed. The only reason why he repeated himself was that he had to do it from one end of the city to the other. When word got to the king, the people repented after a three-day fast, and the Lord relented of that decision. Jonah was not a false prophet. He delivered a true word of the Lord. Also in Ezekiel 33, the Lord mentioned that if the wicked repent of their ways, that he would relent of the evil that he thought to bring upon them. But even someone who is righteous, if that person goes the wrong way, that he would destroy them. In Nineveh, because they repented, the Lord relented of that decision. However, the Ninevites later returned to their sinful ways. And in the books of Nahum and Zephaniah the prophets, it speaks about the destruction of Nineveh. If you go to Nineveh, or if you go to Google it today, and you look up Nineveh, you will see a wasteland, for the most part. So just because Jonah said it and it didn't happen like that, it is not the Lord's will that any should, should perish, but that they should come to repentance. It is the goodness of God that leads people to repentance. So in Revelation 2, when the Lord mentioned that he gave Jezebel time to repent, but she did not, Many false prophets see the Lord's leniency, so to speak, as if he approves of their actions, not knowing that he has given them space to repent. And after that, he is dropping the hammer. I would much rather if the Lord told me, go and tell so-and-so that you're going to be blind for a season. Go and tell so-and-so that you need to get your house in order because you're going to die. I'd much rather if the Lord gave me a hard message like that for a false prophet than for me to sit by and do nothing while false prophets prevail and that people perish. The Lord said my people perish for a lack of knowledge. We're also told to study show ourselves approved. It's absolutely sickening how these false prophets... In times past with false prophets, it was easy for them to say the Lord said because it's much harder to get to the Word of God then. Now we have Bibles all over the place. Bible apps. It is so easy, but we have to spend time learning the Word of the Lord. And also spend time with the Lord. And not be satisfied with, with going to church. It's almost like forget about church attendance. Spend time with the Lord. A lot of times how people, for example, get swept up into cults or get swept up into false religions is because they are approached by people. Christians are approached by people who know the Bible better than they, are, they do and they wrap circles around them and take them astray. We can all get deceived. One of the things about the Holy Spirit is at some point in time, He will let us know this isn't right. I recently heard someone say something that was very profound. That if the Lord has to shout at you, that means you're far away from him. One of the things when Ezekiel, or not Ezekiel, but Elijah was in the wilderness and he heard the still voice of the Lord or a small still voice of the Lord, that's because they were close. He didn't hear the Lord's voice in the earthquake, the wind, or the fire. Didn't need to. He was close to the Lord. So get close to the Lord so you can hear his voice. Sometimes what you'll hear when a person is speaking is, liar and you'll know that person is telling a lie or you get close to the Lord and he may show you in a dream or a vision this person is coming and this person is going to say that or just this person is coming do not trust that individual 
and under no circumstances do you disobey the Lord because an individual come along, comes along and say, Oh, the Lord said. I, for one, have no qualms about telling a person, Oh, the Lord said that, huh? Well, the Lord told me you're a liar, and what your actions have just done is confirmed that to be a fact. And not that I needed it, because if the Lord said it, then it is true. In Jeremiah, one of the things the Lord said is, Cursed be a man who puts his faith in another man. So if you trust in another man, the Lord is saying, Cursed. There are people that I have respect for and I'll receive from, but I'm always discerning. Back in Genesis, Adam could have trusted, trusted his wife Eve, but she got led astray by the devil, and as a result, she led him astray. Abraham, he could trust his wife Sarah, but when she suggest, suggested that they have a child with a concubine, he should not have taken that advice. So you always have to be discerning. Have I been caught before? Oh yes. And thank the Lord for getting me out. If you ever watch boxing, or probably even MMA, one of the things the referee will say is about protecting yourself at all times. Once you step in that ring, you keep your guards up. When it comes to spiritual warfare, it's like the moment you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are in the ring. Keep your guard up. Many people talk about putting on the full armor of God daily. Well, you don't have to put it on if you don't take it off. The sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, it is sharper than a two-edged sword, but you have to be able to use it. Study to show yourself approved. Do not let anyone come and deceive you. But one of the great things with all of this is sometimes you may not even know a word in the Bible, so to speak, but if you have the Holy Spirit, he will help you to discern fact from fiction. Everything I've just said, I have no problems with you putting to the test. If there are any mistakes in this presentation, let God be true and let me be a liar. I accept responsibility for all those things. But at no point in time will I say that I'm perfect or put myself on the same level on God or above God. Those kind of things that got the devil cast out of heaven. It is not always easy to spot the true from the counterfeit. But do not be fooled by titles. Jesus lets us, let us know in Matthew 7, all the way down to verse 21, that people would come to him saying, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out devils in your name? Done wonderful works in your name? But the Lord's response will be, depart from me. I never knew you, you worker of iniquity. Get to know the Lord. When you know the Lord for yourself, it makes it harder for you to accept a counterfeit. When you know the Lord, you'll be able to tell those whom he sent. Yes, some are very sneaky. I was a soldier. I know what it's like to be in the woods. I know what it's like to be in the presence of snakes and didn't know they were there. But something happened that changed it. Maybe I looked down, maybe I smelled something, heard a noise. Some people have crept in, you say unaware because in a lot of cases, the church has been asleep. A part of the reason for writing Raising the Wilderness was that there are many pastors who have put the prophets out of churches and the church walls are down and the enemy is free to come in and go. That should not be so. Prophets are not gods. They can be fooled. 1 Kings 13 is an example of that. We also see a case where with Elisha, after he had prophesied to the Shunammite that she was going to have a child within a year, a son to be exact, and it happened. That son died. And when the woman came to him and he sent his servant Gehazi to intercept her 
to find out what was going on. She basically told Gehazi everything was okay. And Elisha said that maybe the Lord had hidden it from him. So if you know a person claiming to be a prophet or any other minister who seemingly knows every single thing, you're probably dealing with someone who's operating in the spirit of divination. And even then, that person doesn't know everything. With the case of Jonathan Jambers opposing Moses, they could do some things, but not everything. I have seen people with a spirit of divination who could not tell that the Lord's going to make a move. I can tell you from personal experience that the devil cannot do anything to hide it from the Lord, but the Lord can hide things from the devil. Some people are attracted to certain things because of power. Like Simon the sorcerer, but Peter wouldn't tolerate it. And we have to recognize those things in the church. We have to confront certain things, confront it. None of the Israelites were going to gain victory for those 40 days when Goliath came out and was taunting the Israelite army. But he wasn't just taunting the army, he was taunting God. And no Israelite would stand up until David came out of the wilderness and said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Try putting, they tried put, giving him Saul's armor, he would have none of it. Didn't fit, plus he's not accustomed to it. And David went out with the weapons that he was accustomed to using and he confronted and killed the giant. Years later, or correction, years before, when the Israelites were about to enter the Promised Land, the Lord had given them permission to go possess it. The 12 spies went into the Promised Land. 10 of them were complaining about the giants, the sons of Anak, who made them seem as if they were grasshoppers. But two men, Caleb and Joshua, were willing to confront the giants. Unfortunately, because of those 10 men, the Israelites experienced a 40 year delay in reaping their promises. I can tell you this, anyone who stands in the way of me and my God ordained destiny is in danger of hellfire. And even more, they're in danger of getting bowled over by me because the only thing that's gonna hold me back is the Lord. And I don't want anyone else to suffer a delay in reaching their destiny because someone is standing in their way, a messenger of Satan. With Elemas, we see how we opposed Sergius Paulus from receiving the true word of the Lord. There are many people in churches who are truly opposing people from receiving the truth of the word of the Lord. And some of those people are in the pulpits. I thank the messenger who conveyed the message to give me the assignment. And this was only a part of it. When you receive a message from the right source and the right messenger, it will take you in the right direction. Do not entertain false prophets. I said before, and I'll say it again, we may not rock them to sleep as in times past, but we certainly need to put an end to their ministries. Have nothing to do with them. Have nothing to do with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Rebuke them, rebuke them, rebuke them. May the Lord embolden you to be like a David who will not cower from the giants, but will run up to them and put them to sleep. Who will not be deterred. Because just as they are adamant about opposing you from doing work of the Lord, you need to be as adamant, or even more, to oppose them from doing the work of the devil, especially while using the Lord's name. Jesus said that if we love him, we should follow his commands. That also includes not practicing sorcery 
not being false prophets, not fleecing his sheep, not feeding on his sheep. I could keep going for hours about this, but I've said more than enough. Because <laughs> a part of prophetic protocol is no one will speak and no one will shut up. Six, three, forty, forever. For six hours he had to endure, the nails in his hands, and so much more. For all those hours he paid our receipt with a nail that pierced his feet. Then our Heavenly Father took him away, but he died for our sins that day. For three days he got some rest, and then he rose so believers could attest. He stayed on earth for 40 more days and shared more of his holy ways. Forever we can live because he paid for every sin we commit and every mess we made.